Hello and welcome to episode 90 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRP. And joining me once again is League Freak, who you can find on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? I am very angry for all of the Canberra Raiders fans. They got screwed. They got absolutely screwed. The referee screwed them. We said that we'd be fair to the referees all year until they made a howler and they made a fucking howler in the grand final. Yeah, it was... Uh, I, I look at it and I saw there was there was moments in that game where there was one or two or three calls in there that were those sort of typical 50-50 type calls and each yeah. time they went the rooster's way and it it looked... It looked bad a, a bit I mean, in that regard. If one of them had gone the other way, you could have gone, eh, you know, fair enough, and you would have passed it off. But for – and they're weird things. Mm. They're weird things. But I think the referees were attempting to have a fast, free-flowing game instead of mm. trying to just, you know, police the game like they would for any other regular game. And I hate that they do that. They should just treat them all the same. Yeah, to stop bound to this pressure that finals and origin must be refereed differently. Just referee them all the same. That way, you don't have to be worrying about consistency issues. And that's what, what we had tonight you, was consistency issues. What did you think of the game overall as a spectacle? Like, I really enjoyed it, but I tend to like those sort of games. Like, I like a game where it's a grinding. You know, let's see who breaks first. I know not everyone likes a game like that, though. No, it was good. Um, Canberra were much stronger in attack, mm-hmm. uh, especially at retaining possession than I than I thought they would be. Mm-hmm. I thought come the, and I even said it on Twitter, I thought that if the Raiders didn't score a try within that first 10, 15 minutes of second half, the Roosters were going to come home over the top of them and run away with it. Mm-hmm. And that didn't quite happen. And it was mostly because Kronk got sin-binned correctly. Yep, I might 100% add. correctly. Um. And that sort of gave Canberra an extra 10 minutes of, you know, attacking play and kept it kept them in the game a bit longer. Yeah. Unfortunately, they were unable to, to convert it into points when they needed it. And I think this is what's going to happen with this game is a lot of people will be looking at, and fair enough, as poor Canberra and how they, they were, you know, unfortunate losers and all that sort of thing. And the one thing that's going to get, that will get forgotten here is how well the Roosters did defend. Oh, they defended their, like, maybe the best defensive effort I've ever seen in a grand final. They were under the pump. And the thing with the Raiders, they had so much field position and so much possession. Actually, Victoria Dawson was uh, tweeted me about this after the game. You, Whenever you see that and you don't come away with points, you're always inviting the loss, I feel. And they had as many opportunities as you could want to win the game early in that second half when Kronk was sent off um, to the sin bin, sorry, and to not capitalise on it. I mean, they only come away with two points from the penalty. Um, At the end of the day, that is probably something that they can look at and say that cost them the game. Yeah, and the thing is too, it's not like they were woeful in attack when they had those opportunities either like Mm. they threw everything on different sides of the field different attacks like they were throwing the ball around they'd try a bit of second phase play they did some kicks to corners they they a few grubbers behind the line just nothing could work and pretty much everything they could have possibly done in that game worked you know as it as it was supposed to i think if you had to put camera up against any other side uh tonight they probably would have come away with a 20 or 30 point win just yeah, that Bruce's defense just it just hung in there for grim death. That's what it did. One hundred percent. They, yeah, I agree with you. I think that the Raiders would have slaughtered most teams today, um, and the the Roosters' defensive effort. I mean, you know, they didn't do much in attack to write home about, but and I thought that a lot of that had to do with the Raiders' defense. I thought the Raiders' defense was outstanding as well, and the way they took, um, basically Cronk. Uh, Kiri and Tedesco out of the game was sensational. Um, I've been bagging Crocker all year for his defence. His defence was fantastic in this game. Possibly, um, I'm going to go ahead and leave you. I'm going to say he's possibly the best defender in the entire match um, well, there, because he made close to 50 tackles, I think. And there was a couple of tackles where he smashed his opponent. 
you know, yeah, and, and shut it down, shut down everything. It was, I, I've been on his case for his whole career, basically, but he stepped up and was fantastic today in defence. Yeah, complete package. Um, and, and a genuine threat with the ball in hand on a few occasions, too, when he got outside his man. He's just... There's just times you look at him and go, he just misses that half a half a yard of pace to get mm-hmm. outside his man and, and create general opportunities for for Kotrick. but um, he come come awfully close to uh, taking a bomb and scoring a try in the first half. God, that that was a near thing, and yeah. he is he is an absolute thief in the night when it comes to scoring tries like that. Yeah, um, he is. Caesar just need to put an extra you know two inches of height on that kick, and he would have been fine. Yeah, I think if you had to look at the the Raiders' overall team, and like most of them played really well, I think Caesar was probably a little bit of a weak point. Um, Massively. Yeah, it, it he's, you know, he did he did the job that he can do in that in that on that occasion, um, and I think to expect more out of him is a little bit unfair, because he kind of is the player you are the player you are at the end of the day. But, yeah, I, I feel like he was a little bit of a weak point. They missed a little bit of creativity in the halves, I, I think. Um, Whiten was outstanding. I, I think oh, we phenomenal. Best player on the field by some way. Um, I don't think anyone would have thought that he would have been able to play a game like that in, in his first ever grand final. I think knowing that... Um, most of Canberra's kicking was going to come from Caesar, and Caesar was mm. playing poorly. Mm. I don't think anyone would have thought that White would have come out and carried his halves partner as much as he did. Uh, he was phenomenal. Yeah, physically dominant, you know, and, and just every time he got the ball, he looked dangerous. Um, just incredible. And as a, you know, to be a... a on the losing team to win the Clive Churchill medal. It has only happened a few times. Um, but I, I, th- I don't think anybody could really look at that and s- say anything other than he deserved it, really. He was outstanding. Absolutely. It, uh, he deserves to be in the Australian squad at the end of the year mm-hmm. after that performance. Um, and if he, if he plays like that every game next year, he wins the Dalian medal hands down. He yeah. was brilliant tonight. I haven't seen him play that well ever. Um, just shows you what he can do. And also shows you that he is he's going to be one of those clutch players for a long time in the future as well, knowing that he doesn't get um, overawed by the occasion. He was he was absolutely brilliant. Can't speak highly enough about his performance tonight. Yeah, and you know the other thing about him too, because at fullback, you know, he he showed he was a good athlete, but it, it wasn't working for him. And they've moved him into 5'8", and it just he's just improved. Every single, like, game, he's just got better and better and better. And it's interesting now that and he's still only a young bloke that he's at this point where he can put on a dominant performance in a grand final, uh, win Clive Churchill medal on the losing team. And, I mean, they couldn't do anything to stop him at times. It was it was. Friggin' incredible. I couldn't believe it. Um, Papali as well. I thought he was the second best player on the field. Um, yeah, outstanding. He was, Absolutely again, just, outstanding. Just another beast of a performance. And he played a ton of minutes tonight too. He looked like he was out on his feet, took a 10-minute break, come back out, and was just still... like No defender got past him. Mm. Um, still making powerful runs. Oh, I, can't, the, I can't believe the metres he keeps making. Like, and... and the NRL, I mean, it's full of great forwards. To to stand out making metres as a forward and making them in the middle of the field too, he's not making them on the edges. Uh, you've got to be, uh, like, you've got to be one of the greats. And the last month, he has played like one of the greats. It's been incredible to watch. Absolutely. I mean, he's been Tormalolo-like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, outstanding. So I thought he was the, the second best player and... Um, <laughs> You know, I think that if the Raiders had a one, I wouldn't have been shocked if they did co-winners of that, <laughs> the uh, Clive Churchill medal. But yeah, outstanding by both of them. Um, who do you who did you think were the best for the Roosters? Um, Jared Maria Hargraves. I mean, yeah. to start with, not only did he have to make plenty of meters, but he had to shut down as well as, well as he could. Um, mm. 
Josh Papali. Mm-hmm. And those two had an epic battle in the middle. And I don't think that battle's ever going to get talked about much, but they those two blokes had immense games. Mm-hmm. Practically carried their packs with them. Um, that and... Daniel Tupo had a surprisingly good game. And it comes... Like, I don't think many people look at it and think that he had a standout game or anything like that. But in the end, he took a ton of hit-ups into the into the charging down uh, Raiders' defensive line because the one thing that stood out for me in this game is Canberra's kick chase was phenomenal and it had to be to shut down Tedesco, which they did for most of the match. Um, so Tupo took it on himself to try and, I dare say, get around that impact of the uh, Raiders' kick chase by taking a lot of those kick chases and, uh, sorry, kick returns and hit ups into the middle and it really helped his forwards out a fair bit as well. Uh, so I rated his performance pretty highly. Yeah, look, I it was funny because we were talking before the podcast started. I missed it. Hey, I didn't see that out of him. I like because we've done player ratings for both teams, so we'll go through them in a bit. But uh, yeah, when we're going through the player ratings, and like I was putting mine, and then you said yours, and I was like, holy shit! <laughs> and then you told me how many meters he done, and I just missed it. It's weird, hey. I just completely didn't see that. Yeah, in the game, it's, so. it's because they were they were all meters of toil. They weren't meters where he made one big run down the sideline, and that's where you know eighty percent of his meters come from. Mm-hmm. They were just constantly into the guts, just mm-hmm. smashing himself in there. And I think a lot of times, a lot of wingers when they when they have games like that, they kind of go a bit unrecognized. But he, he helped his forwards out immensely tonight. It's a bit of a weird game, this one, in that, like, I feel as though I want to talk about about how good the Raiders played and with so much praise, and I kind of want to talk about how disappointing the Roosters were, but the Roosters won the game. It, like, am I wrong about that? It feels as though the, the Raiders were the better team. Am I wrong about that? Obviously, they weren't. They lost the game, but yeah, I don't I, know. I, I I get what you mean. I think the Roosters were the better team for the majority of the game. Mm-hmm. The difference being, though, and it's been the case for the last two years, is the Roosters know how to hang in hang in on a game mm-hmm. and pull out one or two plays when they need them to to just get those wins in those close matches. And that's the difference between your absolute superstar sides and everybody else. And it's something that Melbourne used to do an awful lot, too, in years gone by, even this year to a degree. Um but yeah, that's kind of what the Roosters did. They just constantly hung in there. And then when an opportunity came and, you know, came and presented itself, they took it with both hands and capitalised on it straight away. Um, whereas Canberra were just... they had I'll say this. They had the right game plan. Their kick chase was strong. They were busting huge metres up the middle. Um, they threw a heap of different plays at the, the Roosters' defensive line so that they, could, they were never um, consistent or predictable. Mm-hmm. with something different every time, which is... Which is the way you've got to do it. Um, they moved the ball around. Uh, you know, there's nothing that Canberra, I think, could have done any differently to change the result of that game. It was just, that's the difference between playing against an absolute superstar side and everybody else. Mm. And I think, like, one thing about the Raiders, they've got some great plays in that team. They probably haven't got that out and out it, the game is broken from nothing. The, and Tedesco is that player for the Roosters. Latrell Mitchell can do it. He didn't do it in this game. But the the Raiders don't... I feel like they don't have a player like that. Like, there's a lot of power runners and, and big bodies and stuff like that. They don't have someone that can break it open. And I think it's someone like, a, in the past, Michael Jennings, who you could get him the ball and all of a sudden he was just in space from nowhere. It didn't matter how good your defence was. I feel as though the Raiders probably lack a player like that. I think, yeah. They, they kind of had that with Whiten when he was at fullback because he could mm-hmm. come along whenever he wanted to. Mm. But... In saying that, he has been much more consistent and much, much more valuable to the Raiders side at five eighth. That you wouldn't, I wouldn't put him back at fullback now anyway. Besides, Nickel Klockstad has been an absolute revelation back there, so you wouldn't, you don't need to change it anymore. But I get what you're saying. Um, maybe Bateman's the closest they've got to that. Yeah, I, I was very disappointed with Bateman in this game. Um, I know he made a lot of tackles, but I thought that. After what he did earlier in the, the week, 
with his manager. Um, I thought he needed to come out and have a great game, and he just didn't, in my opinion. Um, I was very disappointed in how he played. Um, but, but I, thought... stood out for, I was going to say, one thing that stood out for me was the fact that I don't think the Raiders pulled off one one on one strip in the whole game. No, they tried. You know what? I feel as so though they were trying a lot early on, and I felt like they were pretty close to giving away penalties a few times because they were getting wrapped up in the ball and slowing to play the ball. And I, I wonder if it sort of made them a bit you know, shy about going for it uh, for the rest of the game. But, yeah, you're right. It, it wasn't a factor in this game, hey? And uh, absolutely. And I think one or two could have could have been key for the side. And I think, yeah. as you said, I think they gave up on it when they thought they were going to get pinged for giving away penalties and the like. Mm. Um, speaking of penalties. Yes. Well, not so much penalties, but referees' decisions. Yeah, um, let's go through the big ones. Because there's like, well, there was three big ones during the game, really, that I feel people are going to talk about and want to hear us talk about and our opinions on them. The first one comes from very early in the game. And I'll say this, the referee decision was correct. Mm-hmm. But for me, the rule is outdated and needs to change. And this is when Kiri, I think it was, went to put in a kick. It was either charged down slash ricocheted off Sia Soliola. Mm-hmm. So essentially charged down. And then it ricocheted across and hit the Roosters trainer on the full. Yeah. And this happened in the Raiders' half. None of the Roosters players had turned around to chase the ball, but one of the Raiders players had it. might have been Whitehead. He was chasing the ball, and if it hadn't hit that trainer, he would have been the only, place, only player close to it. He would have picked it up or could have towed it ahead, and there was mm-hmm. no one around him. So that would have been a huge advantage to the Raiders. Instead... The rule says that there has to be a scrum and it goes to the team who's um, in the opposition's half, essentially. So the Roosters got the loose head and feed in another set of six. And that just seemed unfair to me. I just think that was the Roosters trainer was on the ground. What's he doing on there after two or three minutes of play? Yeah, that was kind of weird. I don't get why that's there. And what I'd like to see is in situations like that, um, instead of the weird system they've got there, have and it doesn't and I'd, I'd have this for it doesn't matter what tackle it's on, if it hits a trainer, okay, a turn a handover to the team, um, to the to the opposition team. So if it was Canberra's trainer who got hit, then it's a you know the Roosters get the ball handed to them, no scrum or anything like that, just instant handover. And because it was the Roosters trainer who got hit, then it should just be a handover, just give it to give it to the Raiders from where the trainer got hit and just play on from there. That way you, you get those trainers out of that. Now, they're either sitting in the defensive line or they're sitting five, ten metres back from it. Or if they're not in the defensive line, they're sitting one or two metres behind the attacking line. And they're there all the time. And I, what's the point of having a coach if you're going to have trainers running out of orders all bloody game as well? And I, I just hate the fact that they're there all the time. They should be there to go out and treat players. And that's it. And if no one's down and no one's injured, then there's no need for a trainer to be on the field after two or three minutes. These are professional athletes. They're not going to get thirsty after two minutes. Yeah, it was weird. He was on the field. I mean, and it was very, very unlucky. Like, he was, I mean, he must have been 15, 20 metres behind the play. Um, it's just one of those things. I I see where you're going with if it hits one of your trainers, it's like on you. It's, a, it's against you. But I also think that, I can see where I like the idea of there being a rule that is basically the same for the trainers or the referees. I guess it would be the same if it, say, hit the uh, one of the cameras that are hanging over the field or if it hit somebody that had run onto the field, something like that. I guess it's probably the same if it hits one of the... You know the kids that run the the ball. You know that the, the ball boys or something like that. I, I, if the rule is the same for all that, I'm pretty happy with it. But at the same time, I wonder. You know, it, it going with the attacking team. I, I'm not sure about that. And I, like you were telling me, the rule is different to what I thought it was. So I always thought that the the scrum went to the team that was attacking with the ball no matter where they are on the field. But you were saying that it's different depending on what half the field you're in. Yeah, so I was like you. I, I initially thought during the game that it went to the team that was on attack. 
And mm-hmm. so my argument was, surely the ball's been charged down, therefore Canberra's on the attack. Because mm-hmm. the Roosters in, are going to be going back not to attack the ball, but to defend it and, you know, stop someone from running away. But I was told on, on Twitter there by a few people that the rule is um, the ball goes to the team who's in the opposition's half. Mm-hmm. So if Canberra had to put that kick in and it come off their train or whatever else, that would have been a Roosters ball if it was in the if it was in the Raiders' half. So that's kind of how it works, which just seems a bit odd. Um, mm-hmm. And a few other people would tell me, oh, it's just been the rule forever. Um, there's been a lot of rules that were around back in 1908 that we don't have anymore. And I can tell you right now, as a historian, and this won't surprise anyone, that they didn't have two referees and 15 trainers on the field back in 1908. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd be arguing that the rule needs to be changed. And what I suggested there would only apply to trainers getting hit. All the others, I'm happy with the rule staying as it is because a lot of that is incidental, accidental, and it's not to do with, you know, the, those incidents aren't there because a certain team put them there. Like the yeah. referees have to be there. The cameras are going to be there. The one team doesn't demand cameras to be put there, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm happy for the rule to stay as it is for those things. But for trainers, something needs to be done to get them away from the action of the play and stop coaching players. I think yeah. that's the coach's job. The trainer's job should be out there to treat players who've got injured, and that's it. I'd be happy with that. If if it was the keep the same rule, but it's different for trainers, I'd be happy with that. Yep. Um, Just so, to get the trainers away from the play. Okay. Because yeah. we've even seen in games in the past too where trainers have been close to, you know, a, a ch- Say a turnover has happened and a player's made a break, the trainer's almost been collected by a player, or they've had to swerve out of the way, or something like that. Or you know, they're too close to the action; they're too, they're on the field too often, and they shouldn't be. Yeah, I agree. And like they, as you say, a lot of instances, trainers have had to do bloody moves out of the matrix to make sure the ball doesn't hit them. So yeah, it'd be it'd be something extra to get them thinking about being off the field rather than just hanging around on the field, which they do too often. I, and this is a little bit off topic. Um, I think they need to change the rules in terms of um, the trainer being able to shut down play, um, call the referee to stop the play because they've got an injured play because we're seeing it happen in every single game. We're seeing it used in a lot of circumstances that I think uh, it, it wasn't intended for. It was intended for if a player was down with a broken ankle or something, and we're seeing yeah. that a lot. Too, uh, we're seeing it too often with players that are, are winded or they're, you know, they've copped a bit of a knock, but they're just hurt. They they're just getting up slow, which is different to being injured. Yep. Um, and we're never ever seeing it when a team is on the attack. We're only seeing it from teams that are defending, and the player can be way way you know, back down the field, we're still seeing it happen. So I think something needs to happen there. They've got to change that rule because that's being used as a tactic now. Um, yep. If you if you're defending and you've got a player that's it, for any reason, doesn't matter what it is, you stop the play. That's just how it is now for the trainers and it's hurting the game. It is. I'd actually say that the only reason why a trainer should be calling for play to stop is if mm-hmm. he needs the medicab. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. And if he calls for a player to stop, then a medicap has to come out and has to take the player off the field, and that player doesn't come back on the field. We've got to start cracking down on this. Yeah. We can't just sit there and just be anti pants. We've got to get, make some tough rules so that these things aren't being rorted because that's what's, ta- that's what's taking place here is coaches are using the trainers, obviously, mm-hmm. to stop play when they need to, to stop momentum, all this sort of thing, try and help defensive lines get set to you know help their sides out that sort of thing and yeah it's i'm gonna go and say it it's borderline cheating and i want to see it i want to see it removed from the game that's why i want to have less trainers on the field and i i agree they should only be allowed to call time off if they need a medicap otherwise they should be treating a player in back play the other thing i would say is if they're in in dropout situations as well where it's probably at its worst where a team has to do a drop out and all of a sudden they've got two or three players that decide they've got cramps, you know, out in front of the try line. Um, if you're in a situation like that, you just got to get off the field, get out the back of the play. 
and allow the dropout. And I think that if play gets stopped because a player is down, maybe it should be an enforced interchange, something like that. You know, if you decide that it's something has happened where a player it needs to, we need to stop play because this player is hurt at that point, we'll then get them off the field. You know, I don't mind if they stop the play and the player leaves the field. I hate it when they stop the play and the player, you know, gets up, pulls his socks up and runs back into the defensive line. That pisses me right off. Yeah, I think with with the dropouts one, the there should be like a, a 15 second shot clock from the moment the referee says drop out. Yeah. Right? And if you've got players that are down in front, you know, in the field of play and they're not back in the end goal and they're down with a cramp, then it's dipshit. Um, a cramp isn't isn't a I know cramps can get bad. We've all had bad cramps, but that's not that's not reason enough to stop play. A trainer no. can train can deal with that in back play if they have to. Um if a player's got a cramp and it's genuine and it's serious enough that they can't get up and they need to get stretches, then so be it. Do the dropout. They can stay offside, but they can't be involved in the play for that set of six. They can yeah. stay on the field, but they can't be involved in the play for that set of six. Yeah, I'd, I'd be up for that because it's just, it, it's become a tactic now yeah. and it needs to be. And I look, I think the HIA has become a tactic as well. It's a free it change. It has um, and it's wrong. Yeah, and like how many times have we seen a player... You know, they. One of the things I saw in this game, and I can't remember the player it was. I wish I could remember who it was. It, might, it wasn't Radley. Key. Oh, was it when yeah. Radley copped one across the nose, and he went down, and then the uh, I think the a set or two later, he went for a hit up, and he dropped the ball cold, and then he came no, off for a HI afterwards. No, you know who? I think it was a Canberra player. Jeez, I could, I just can't remember who it was, and. You know who it was? It was Aiden Caesar, I'm pretty sure. And oh, yes. he got hit around the head. And it didn't hurt him, but he stayed down looking for the... And they didn't go for it. They didn't fall for it from memory. But mm. I, I think that when you get a situation like that, and the, I think the commentators were saying, look, he's he's sort of trying to milk the penalty, but he's making it look like he should come off with a HIA. And neither happened. They, yeah, and, and it, it like... There needs to be something done. I know I don't I don't have the answer right now. I'll have to think about it a bit more. But I think the HIA has become a tactic that they're using to get free interchanges, and which was always going to happen with the way it was set up. And they obviously stop and play when you've got a player down and you're in defence. They need to sort that out anyway. As I said before, when it comes to the HIA thing, I think one way to to cut down on it being used as a tactic is if you do the whole, this player has to come off for HIA, then, I mean, as Dr. Alan Pierce told us several episodes ago, then there's probably something where they need to actually go and get properly checked out. And they probably mm-hmm. shouldn't be going back onto the field at all. Mm-hmm. So I'd be saying in the safety of the player, if they come off for HIA, then they stay off of that whole game and they miss the next week as well until we're confident they've got back to baseline. Yeah, and that I will agree. make teams go, you know what? It's going to be pretty obvious when someone's got bad concussion. And this is something that the RLPA should be all over. Mm-hmm. This is the sort of thing that's up their field. They should be making sure that no one goes on and keeps playing a game after having been concussed, knowing knowing what the you know what damage that can do to them long term. They should be all over this, saying, "No, we fully agree with this idea, and we're going to go through with it, and we we want this to happen." And make clubs force them into putting, yeah, you know, thinking about their players' welfare for a change because that's just not happening. The result is too important to these clubs that they're not even focused on the welfare of the player. And if they are focused on it, it's not enough. It's not They're not giving the player welfare an equal amount of attention as the win. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, look, when was the last time the RLPA came out with some bloody balls over anything at all? Oh, probably that, it was something to do with pay. That's about yeah, it. Yeah, and that's it. And, and you know, that that's it. I've, I've not... not I can't remember, and apologies to the RPA if I'm wrong, but I can't remember a time when they've come out about something about the actual player's health, welfare, not financial welfare, their health welfare. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the, we we barely heard peep from them when Alex McKinnon got injured. The, the yeah. stuff that happened there, I mean, the NRL offered to give him a job. You know, just 
they need to get more vocal. They've got a, they've got power. They've got authority. They need to start swinging their bloody balls around a bit more and do something with it for the for the benefit of the game for the benefit of their players. Yeah, because the players need a voice. It can't keep going down to the individual, you know. Or and it, you know the players don't. The players want to play. You know, if a player gets knocked out this week, he wants to play next week. That's what yeah. they that's what they enjoy doing. Um, so it can't be up to the player. And I don't, man, I put no faith in clubs. So it's there's got to be someone standing up for the players, and that's the RLPA. And you know, where are they? That's right. And in the past, the reason why players would come back out and play on is because a lot of them were on match payments. Mm. Nearly all of them were. That's mm. not an issue now. No. Um, so the players look after financially. So it's not that that aspect is removed from the game. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just pride now is the reason why they want to keep playing, and that's fair enough. But yeah, something needs to be done to, pre- to protect them in that area because they're obviously not thinking with their, all their faculties because you know they've copped a head knock. So yeah, they need someone to come in and say you, we're not going to have you go back out, even if you think you're okay and you can say the alphabet backwards and whatever else. Mm. There hasn't been enough time from when the knock happens to, you know, to determine whether they've come back to baseline, whether they're safe to play again. You can't tell me you can you can be fully recovered from a head knock in ten minutes. Not a bad one. Not one that's, you know, if it's, I've heard if play... it's heavy enough to get you blacked out for a few seconds or for oh. you to have to come off the field yeah. for for an actual HI assessment, then. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't know, but it's one for for um, Dr. Alan Pierce. Obviously, is to find out how long, you know, how quickly can can a player get back to to baseline after they've copped a head knock, minor or major. I'd be surprised if it's ten minutes. Yeah, I can't imagine if you've been switched off, and we've seen some players switched off this year. Um, I can't imagine you're good to go within twenty minutes or so, even. Um, whereas. I I know that sometimes, I, and I've heard players talk about they can get a head knock and it makes them dizzy, and it gives them the appearance that they've they've had a worse knock than they are they've received. Um, but yeah, uh, the ones where you see a player face down in the dirt and then they come back on the field after a HIA assessment, it, it's it's shocking to me that that that's that happens. And look, there's everyone's different. And everyone gets affected by um, by head knocks differently, but I I just find it hard to believe that's at all possible for anyone. Yeah, it seems seems weird. Anyway, um, so that was the going back. That was the first incident. Was the trainer one? <laughs> um, the big one mm. came late in the later in the match in the second half when a kick went up. Two, a, a Roosters player and a Raiders player went up to catch the ball. Um, we don't know who actually touched it, but the ball bounced back into the Raiders' hands and the referee immediately waved six again. Um, the Raiders then took the tackle after throwing it around a little bit and then the referee said, hand over. Mm. Uh, now, the NRL has very quickly released the audio from the referee's microphone of that actual incident. And we will and play it. The, the, the thing is, though, I find it hard still to defend the referees here because there was 80-odd thousand people yelling and screaming and cheering in that stadium, and you can even hear them on the little microphones. I don't know how a referee 15 metres away is going to hear this referee calling out with all the other yelling and whatnot going on. But anyway, we'll, we'll pop it on and have a listen to it. And can I, before we do this, right, Yeah. as a referee, and I don't know how they're trained, I remember watching uh, NFL films, uh, thing about the referees, and it must have been a good 10 years ago now, and the thing that they were talking about with their referees is only call what you see, because if you only call what you see, you're not guessing, and I think in this instance, it, it's important to think about it here, because did the referee that called for six again, did he see something himself? Because if he, if in that split second, if he says, man, hand on heart, I thought that the roosters touched this ball, and I, so I signaled six again, I'm cool with that. You know, the game goes a million miles an hour. Yeah. 
Now, when you look at the replays, it looks like the Roosters player didn't touch the ball. But he's called six again. Now, I, when I was watching the game, I remember, and the camera angle during the game was brilliant because it showed the the ball bounces back, the Canberra Raiders get it, everyone kind of stops for a split second, and the referee's waving his hand in the air going six again at that moment, and then they play on. Obviously, they wouldn't have taken the tackle if they had have realised that the referee had changed his mind, which... I've never seen happen in my lifetime. Have you ever seen that happen? Uh, it may have happened, but it's bloody, it's bloody rare. Yeah, I, I just um, haven't seen it happen. Anyway, this is the audio, so let's play this now. And I'm playing it through my phone, so it's going to be a bit different. There's going to sound like there's a lot of static, but it's actually the crowd noise in the background. So have a listen to this. So, I mean, that that audio there makes it sound like they were yelling that it's still the last, it's still the last. I've got to say, it, when it happened on the field, I I didn't real like, I thought it was still six to go until such time as they said it was a turnover. And I'm like, hang on a second, they, they said it was, you know, six again. Mm. It's... And the thing is, I mean, this is the reason why the referees have hand movements is because the players aren't going to be staring at the referee the whole time. You know, they're there to play football. So they would have seen his, seen the ball go up in a contest. They would have looked at him briefly, seen the hand in the air, and gone, okay, six again. We see him waving his arm. Mm. And then he's, he's obviously going to leave his arm in the air because that's the signal also for last tackle. Yep. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> it, it is. Um, I don't, but the thing is, you can't go changing arm signals now because, I mean, no. everyone just knows what they are. But it's more the fact that they've looked up, they've seen that reception, they've seen that uh, signal, and they've played accordingly. And it's funny because this is going to sound a bit hypocritical. Last, was it last year or the year before? Canberra involved in a game against Cronulla. Mm-hmm. And there was some that happened near the sideline and Cronulla scored a try from it. And the Canberra players were standing around arguing with the referee about something because I think the touch judge put his flag up yep. and then took it back down. And I said at the time, and I still stand by it, is that you play to the whistle. Yeah. And Canberra didn't. They stood around just watching and Cronulla scored. Yeah. And it turned out to be quite an important moment in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but... They kind of did play to the whistle here. They got the they they got the call, which was six again. Yep. And they they took us. They ended up, ended up taking the tackle in the middle, which is what a lot of teams do when they get six again. So they've got both both options right and left available to them from the next play, especially with the Roosters having a retreating defensive line. Mm-hmm. Um, to then get told that that was the last when they could have kicked to a corner somewhere and possibly scored a try out wide or something from it. That's that's the bit that's uh, odd. And look, the Graham Manersley is probably going to come out tomorrow and say, look, they, they did the right thing. And you know what? To a degree, they did do the right thing in the end when they said, you know what? It, it is actually, it wasn't six again. It actually was the last. When you look at the footage, it, was, it should have actually been the last tackle. So that the final result is correct. Mm-hmm. They, they tried, and you hear the audio there. And they have tried to rectify the mistake immediately. Yeah. Um, so this is more of a issue of circumstance, I guess, with all the noise going on there. Um, but still, it's it's still going to be hard to swallow. Yeah, and look, because I don't, you might not have seen this. Graham Andersley's been on TV already. Hey. <laughs> oh dear. He was on Channel Nine. Oh dear. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, he, he was quick to get on. And he basically said the same sort of thing where he said, look, they they made the right call at the end of the day. 
Um, he ga- initially gave the wrong signal and then he, he overturned it and they gave the right signal. You can hear the audio. They say it four times. They say it clearly. Um, and yeah, so he's, he's already been out defending that. The problem with all of that is that we, it, it's a mistake that he signaled six again. And it's a bloody big mistake. And it's mm-hmm. one that it was a game-turning moment. I mean, it's basically, you, you know, a couple of minutes later, the Roosters had scored. It took away a lot of the momentum that the, the uh, Raiders had. I think that it 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 was because of the, t- the tense way the game was going and it was real arm wrestle, that decision broke the tension in the game. And it it really was a... You know, I find it hard to say that a moment like that, and it was in the last ten minutes of the game. I find it really hard to say that it was a game. It was a game deciding decision. But it's bloody hell, it's right next door to a game deciding decision, if you ask me, and especially in a game like that. Yeah, given how close it was and the circumstances around where it happened, like if if the if the right call had been made initially. I dare say Campbell would have kicked that ball over to the right corner because there was no Roosters' defence over there, mm-hmm. and there are fifty-fifty chance of scoring a try there, or yep. maybe forcing a drop out or something along those lines. Either way, they're probably going to be keeping more pressure on. Um, it changes the the last minute complete, the last few minutes of the game completely afterwards, mm-hmm. because Campbell takes a completely different option there. Uh, so. And look, you can't. What it comes down to is the referee cannot signal six again unless he honestly believes it's six again, and then you can't take it back. You know, he can't take it back once the team has the, the team literally played to what the referee said, and you could see it in the footage. They they stopped for that split second. They watched him waving his hand, and then they're like, "Sweet." We got, now we change our tactic. Now, instead of, as you say, going for the corner or something, take it to the middle of the field, take the tackle, don't, you know, don't panic. And then when they do that and the referee gets, says turnover, it's like, well, hang on a second. Um, the referee, you know, they can say he made the right call at the end of the day, but he made a mistake in making that signal. There's no way around that. And it was a real big mistake. It was a real, real big one. I think, too, it shows how the bunker can be invasive because I dare say they were the ones who got in his ear. Well, no one, he didn't get a chance to speak to anyone else. The play didn't stop. Well, he, he said he, six again, and all of a sudden he's changing his mind to last. And you don't hear anyone else talking to him on the field. You don't, you don't get to hear the bunker talking to them on those microphones either. Well, you, you do see the um, pocket referee is saying, no, nah, it's the last, it's the last, right? But the problem was the damage was already done by then. Okay. Like I, if, 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 you, if a referee signals six again, randomly, in the middle of a set, it's six again. Well, the problem is there is change, that the, the pocket referee's time. behind the Raiders, though, wasn't he? He was, yeah. So they can't see him. Well, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so he's behind them. Um. Uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, it's a weird one because they got the call right. It, it wasn't six again, but they they'd they'd stuffed it up by then already, and it's yeah. like just a disaster, an absolute disaster. And, and the Raiders, I think they've got every right to feel very hard done by. I think if you're a referee and you throw your hand up for six again, man, you got to commit. And if you if you a mistake and you got to wear it, you know, they've, he's just got to wear it. Well, I mean, they, they sacked a touch judge a couple of weeks before because he put his flag up on a much similar contentious call mm-hmm. where he thought a player's hand went into touch and it didn't. Mm-hmm. And he got sacked. Well, yep. he got dropped anyway for a few games or whatever, and he's not allowed to, wasn't allowed to refer any further in the finals. I don't see how this is any different. Yeah, because he's he's made a call on something that he didn't see right. You yeah. know, I, I wouldn't have a problem if the referee kept his hand in the air and was saying to the other referee, Did you see it? You know, what would make a call or something else. 
but he'd, he'd, he himself took it upon himself to signal six again. And from that point on, you got to go with it as a referee. I just can't see how he can change your mind. Yeah, I think you, you should. You can't have gone change with... the call. He's or, he already made the call. Once his once his arm starts waving for six again, he's made the call. He can't yeah. take it back. I think the the safe option there is you should have just put his hand up to signify that it's the last, and just be done with it. I think that's the safer option in that case until they get a chance to have a look at the contest. So you know if. Canberra had a scored from that, okay? He put his hands up and just to say it's still the last and Canberra scores in the corner. The bunker can again go back and look at that contest and determine on it then if the referee asks them to. You know, that sort of thing. That That's probably more what should have done in, done in a more safe sort of thing. It, well, and it all comes back to don't call it if you don't see it. Yeah. You know, and, and if... So it just and came if across if, as a guess. It, it did, and... That's the problem. And the, the problem, yeah, and the real problem is, man, as a referee, you can't you can't make a decision and have the game play on from that decision and then take it back. Um, you just can't. And, and the Raiders got screwed on that one, and it really, like, it took it took the you know it popped the balloon. It it, it took the their momentum away and you look you could say they had momentum for a good half of footy they should have scored I, I understand that but it was a game changing moment and I feel very very sorry for the Raiders in that circumstance because I, I really do I think they got screwed on that one yeah uh, and the other, other one was the, the air yeah, earlier in the match um, well, what I'm thinking of was where uh, Josh Papali got, I think it was, got tackled by Cooper Cronk just before he got the ball. Mm-hmm. The commentators were blowing up the lux over it. Oh, what's he supposed to do? Cooper Cronk's giving away 30 odd kilos. I don't care if Cooper Cronk's giving away 300 kilos and a few cars. The rule exactly. is, the rule is what it is. You can't tackle a player when they don't have the ball. And the referee was r- rightfully looked at it. They're all going, what? They're not going to award a penalty try. He wasn't looking at a penalty try. He immediately said no try. Yeah. He also went and said, I want to see if he gets tackled without the ball. That's all he was looking at. And sure enough, that was the case. Cooper Cronk got 10 in the bin. Everything was fine there. I don't care what people think. If they think it was merely seconds here or there, who gives a shit? It's, it's, he broke the rule. Fair enough. I'm happy with yes. that decision. Yeah, same here. Super straightforward uh, decision. By the book, um, they did all of that perfectly. I thought it was infuriating to listen to the commentators, Andrew Johns and Phil Gould, who just decide to ignore certain rules when they feel like it for no particular reason, just how they're feeling at the time. Um, and saying, like, the best one is, like, oh, I don't care if he touched him, like, a few milliseconds before he got the ball. They should call it in full time, in in full speed. And it's like, yeah, the referee called that in full speed, and he they're just double checking it, you know. Um, geez, the the commentary in this game. Did you listen to it? Um, yeah, it was so bad. I watched Fox Sports all year round, and the four times a year during the regular season that I I can't watch them for a live game, which is Origin and the Grand Final. Mm-hmm. Um. Man, that's tedious. I don't that know really how, how you, you poor buggers out there who don't have the luxury of Fox Sports manage to get by watching your one or two random games every week with that amount of just verbal diarrhea going on all the time. That is, that's demoralizing listening to that. They, they're running down the game you love every week. All game, it's like two hours of just being belted with the same whinge and whine all the time. Oh, it's it's taxing. It really is. And, like, you've got to just, I find you just got to try and ignore it as much as you can. But it's, I mean, it's you get two hours of it. And the coverage during the whole day. I mean, we saw, I don't know if you saw it earlier in the day, the Newtown Jets game versus the yeah. Burley Bears. Absolutely fantastic. This incredible, like, last-second victory, and they don't show the presentation. And, you know, and then they get to the big game, and they've gone on about this bloody Viking clap nonstop, 
and they go to, and they about to do the Viking clap and they cross to bloody uh, Ray Warren to talk over it all. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> the coverage was so, so bad. It's, it, you know, a lot of the times it's bad, but they do an all right job considering this year it was just flat out bad. Like a, yeah. the kickoff for the women's game, they're about to kick off. And they missed the kickoff because they were showing the stadium from outside, from a, the bloody, uh, you know, oh, the, the drone. drone footage. Yeah, and like they're showing them about to kick it off, and then they flick to the drone footage, so you missed the kickoff. <laughs> it's just crazy. It's laughable. Mm. But, yeah. Um. So one other thing I want to look at here mm-hmm. is the Daily Telegraph. Mm-hmm. Um, Buzzer said, disgraceful call, story of NRL season. Um, no. Grand larceny, worst call in history. <laughs> <laughs> worst call in history. Uh, yeah, you know what? I could probably think of many, many other worst calls in history. Yeah, 100%. Um, one would be by whoever it was that rang up Phil Rothfield one day and says, congratulations, we're going to make you a journalist at the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> That's a much worse call. What about, what about? Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, how about they're in Germany and they're like, listen, I reckon we can go through Belgium and no one's going to worry about it. What do you reckon? Yeah, let's do it. No one will worry about that. I reckon that was a bad call. Yeah. Let's try um, and take one. on... Let's try and take on Russia through the mountains in the snow. That'll work. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's. That's Napoleon. I reckon we can go to Moscow. And I reckon that if we rug up really well. No, no. I know. I know. I know. But if we rug up really well, I'm talking. Like your best codes. I reckon we can do it. Yeah. Um, another one. Hitler saying, you know what? I know we got a, we, we started a world war in the, the fucking West. But I reckon we can take Russia at the same time. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Another one, oh, the uh, you know, in the Middle East, when uh, Genghis Khan sent some sent some uh, people to the Middle East to trade, and they cut their heads off, and they sent them back. Yeah, that was a bad mistake. Genghis Khan come back and wiped out most of the Middle East after that. <laughs> um, what else? Are there we, any other a, really bad calls? We've had a few bad calls. Yeah, they've been good ones. They've been pretty pretty decent ones, aren't they? Yeah, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't call that that one as grand larceny either. No, no, <laughs> I think they need to be told what grand larceny is. Yeah, if anyone's um, <laughs> if, if anyone's in in the uh, Daily Telegraph offices, um, just just give Buzz a a, uh, a dictionary. That'd be great. No, he needs a thesaurus. That's what he needs. He probably thinks that was around the. Uh, Prehistoric age. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> I, they ate small plants. <laughs> what was the one you you read out before the podcast and we both cracked up about? Uh, was it another one from the telly? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to look here. Yeah, you, know, you know what it was? You know what it was? It was uh, uh, people online blow up because they didn't get to see Dale Braithwaite. Oh, <laughs> two, two horses. Fans funeral after nine ditches Dale Braithwaite. I didn't see anyone talking about it. No. No. The only... The I'll fuck's t- I'll t- blowing up about not hearing you know, Dale Braithwaite? I'll, I'll give you a list of all of the fans, and I'm using air quotes to say fans there, because that, that term's dubious as well, um, who were upset, furious, that Dale Braithwaite didn't sing. Phil Rothfield? <laughs> That's it. End of list. That's it. Yeah. Paul, like, Crawley would, Paul Crawley wouldn't know who it is until Paul Kent tells him. That's true. And then he's like looking for the thumbs up. Oh, I've got the thumbs up. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, excellent. It was a disgrace. Um, yeah, Can I we don't still know. Be friends, Paul? Well, apparently da- Bra- uh, Dale Braithwaite was there last year and they've decided to pull him out again and do the same shit. Um, I don't get it. I don't get it. Like, I, I just don't get it. Horses. It was a shit that... tune when it came out. <laughs> it was part of that that fucking shit era in, in the late eighties, early nineties, where it was just this fucking soft crap. That's a two WS classic, please. 
If I never hear that stupid song again, I'll be happy. Horses, go fuck yourself. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> uh it's always funny look at the Daily Telegraph. Yeah, really. um, that was a good one though. That made us both crack up when you read that one. That was great. I, don't know, I, I saw one article somewhere else that was saying that um, whatever the band was that was the headline act was pretty much a fizzer this year. Yeah, so I didn't see it. I I tuned no, into the coverage. I think. Like, because I switched it off for a bit and then I tuned back in, I think it was maybe 10 to 15 minutes from kickoff and it was still hard to watch. Uh, so I missed the the opening act or whatever it is. I don't know who it was. I couldn't tell you who it was. I don't really care about grand final entertainment. So Yeah, neither do I. Um, at the same time, I don't sit there and make a big whinge over it, but... Um... I think what the NRL needs to realise is if you're going to be playing a hard physical sport where it just goes like the fucking clappers for two hours, pretty much, um, you kind of need music that matches up with that. And having the country music stylings of whoever, Keith Urban, as it was in 2016, Mm. or, you know, people singing ballads, yeah. It's it's not it doesn't quite work together. It's not right. People want to get they want to be hyped up and pumped up and so like and you need to get rock bands out there playing rock songs. Mm-hmm. Um and Daryl Braithwaite isn't a rock singer. No. Nah, he's got to be nearly 70, right? Oh, his horses would be. Yeah, how long's a horse live? I think a horse lives for 30 years. Well, it depends how long you hold on to the can of pal for. On that note, we should move on. (laughs) Yes, yes, move on. I'm starting. I was. You heard me winding up to go down some roads. Yeah, I I opened that. I went down that path there. I opened the gate, walked through it, and I went, "Oh no, you're going to follow me." (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Steer uh, away from that. We should. Um, Did you see the? the promos for like next year when they're bringing back uh, Tina Turner. Yeah, I mean it was hard not to see it given they played them fifty three times. Yeah, I, look, I I get it, I, and people were pumped about it. It was, it was kind of cool that people were excited about it. But like, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, man, Tina Turner's going to walk out. She's a fucking eighty man. That's that's exactly what I was saying. I'm going, you know, I don't get me wrong. I loved what she did in the late 80s, early 90s for, Australia, uh, for Rugby League in Australia because that yep. was phenomenal. We have never had an advertising for sport in Australia as good as that. And I dare say we probably never will. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am actually not opposed to that song being used again. Mm-hmm. I just don't think having an 80-year-old woman doing it is the right go. Yeah, and look, I... And no disrespect to Tina Turner, but, you know, nah. age catches up to all of us. I mean, I'm an old bastard now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just the game hasn't been afraid to get people on to do rejigs of songs. Mm-hmm. I don't know why we couldn't get some, you know, get Beyonce out to sing Simply the Best. I mean, Beyonce, she'd be worth five million bucks. She'd do it for five million, I'm sure. That'd be five million well, well spent. Yeah, it You'd really it would. To- you do that over three years, that works out pretty much even. Yeah, you just got to get a fucking. You say, listen, Beyonce, it's five million bucks, and we just three, three and a half it. minutes. Yeah, she'd do it. She'd do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You can't I, tell me that wouldn't be effective. She'd do I, that brilliantly. She really would. I kind of hope. And look, Tina Turner is fantastic, um, and she could come out and still rock it. Like apparently, Dolly Parton is still really good. When when you go and see her, she's really really good still, yeah. um, you know. And, and but then there's some of them that you see them, and it's like, oh man, this is a bunch of old people, you know. Yeah. Like I couldn't imagine going and seeing say Fleetwood Mac's on tour, right? Oh, they were on tour. I can't imagine you go to a Fleetwood Mac concert, and you watch these degenerate people, and they were all degenerates. I mean, you. It, it's weird about Fleetwood Mac. It's like, oh, there was so it's so great this story. No, no, no. This story, there were a bunch of bloody degenerates, 
and they sung some good songs. I can't imagine seeing them on stage and they're all old and they're just, you know, reminiscing about the days when they all cheated on each other with each other and we're just doing all the drugs. I can't imagine that's fun. <laughs> well, yeah, it's... Uh... I always said it would it would be great if the uh, NRL had the balls to say you know what we're gonna we're gonna get Metallica on for for the grand final. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Metallica. That's the sort of thing because that's the sort of set that would suit them perfectly too. You just say right, we just yeah. need you to build out five of your loudest, fastest songs you got, and they yeah. could just do anything they had from the eighties and just follow follow it up with Enter Sandman at the end, and everyone would be going nuts. Go crazy, yeah. You'd be all pumped up and fired up. You want to go out there and smash someone? Everyone would be pumped for that. And can but, we you know, have the pre-game entertainment within an hour of the fucking game as well? Like, isn't pre-game entertainment supposed to be before the game? Not fucking three and a half hours before it, like they've got it. Like, I think that I understand that Channel 9 needs its moment to have a bunch of talking dickheads, you know, in front, sitting there in front of the crowd while the crowd's waiting for the game to start. But come on, man. We can't have the pre-game entertainment so much earlier on. You know, and what's that? What was that thing that fucking that welcome to country shit? Like, what the fuck? Huh? What oh, the, what the, what Ryan the thing James. that Ryan James did. Oh, yeah. no, that's that's the Aboriginal thing. That that's fair enough. That's that's I, walking them to the to the land and whatnot else. I I'm okay with that. Look, the problem I'm I'm finding with all of this is that massive gap that you mentioned between when the pregame entertainment ends and when the actual game starts is perfect evidence as to why the NRL grand final starts far too late. Yep, 100%. If they just, and, they need to put it all together, it's like, do do your fucking welcome to country, right? They yeah. don't need a 10-minute fucking wait for the next thing. It's like, do your welcome to country, whatever the fuck you're going to do, you know, fucking sing the national anthem or whatever. You don't even need the teams out there for that. And just fucking have Metallica playing as the teams are running out. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Enter Sandman and the fucking teams are running out. You tell me that stadium wouldn't be going bloody crazy. Yeah, they they, they can make it tighter. I mean, the fact is, the AFL that's still has a daytime grand final. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, the AFL still has a, has a daytime grand final. Mm-hmm. People love it. It works. Rugby League always had daytime grand finals. People loved it. It worked. Why Why do we have to have it at night time? Because Channel 9 wants it? What have they done for the game of Rugby League in the last few years to allow them to have a voice as to when Rugby League should be played? All they've done is death ride it and try and kill it to try and lower the price so they can get it cheaper next time around. Why should they get rewarded for that sort of behaviour? And that's an, that's an allegation. I don't know if that's true or not. So I'll say allegedly. But that's my opinion. <laughs> And it's hard to argue with that opinion because I made it and because that's what they do. I, you know what? <laughs> if if cha- they, the game should kick off no later than seven o'clock, right? And if they want to squeeze the juice out of it at, on the back end, I, I'm willing to make half time a little bit longer, just a little bit, not heaps longer, but just a little bit longer. And then afterwards, you go and you go to the press conferences the co- and show the whole press conference for the coaches and the players. You know, there's ways to extend the, and then put on Lethal Weapon. <laughs> I'll sit through Lethal Weapon. Like they put on the new, the latest Rambo, where like fucking Sylvester Stallone's like 72 years old and <laughs> roided up to the fucking eyeballs. Right? He's so puffy, it's incredible. And like he's he's somewhere in Asia, and he's got the the fucking people come up to him and they're like, oh, come and takes us into Burma, and he's like, don't go into Burma, it's fucking just shitstorm. And so some blonde chick comes up and says, oh, let me talk to him. And she talks him into it, of course. And it's just it's just crap. Get rid of that crap and put on Lethal Weapon. I want to see Martin Riggs getting tackled into a pool. I want to see all that shit. I want to see him trying to talk the guy off the roof and then jumping anyway with him. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see fucking 72-year-old roided up Sylvester Stallone doing all the HGH. <laughs> yeah, the the, uh, the latest Rambo movie should have been just just been titled Rambo, more CGI. Well, you know that's what all he they've... does. He's he's too slow moving now that he just has to rely on the CGI to do all the heavy lifting in his movies now. 
and you know the best thing is he's made a new one that's coming out soon. Yeah, even slower than before. The best Rambo was the one where he went to Afghanistan. That was the shit. Yeah. That was I, the best one. He, he's now getting to slower than Steven Seagal King Fu, Kung Fu move speed. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, Steven Seagal. He, uh, he just sort of moves a, around, just does backhand chops and the occasional high kick, but they're so slow, he has to sort of put it out there and everyone has to run into it to make it look effective. <laughs> 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 I'm here all day, fellas. I'm just going to hold this pose. He's just him and he just, he just does a pose, yeah. <laughs> I should tell my story about when my friend got knocked out in the golf course. Do you want to hear it? Um, is it PG? Yeah, it's PG. It's PG. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, Go for yeah. it. Okay, so we're teenagers and we're at, I wonder if I should say, yeah, fuck it. We're at Ashley Golf Course. We're teenagers, right? And I don't know what we were doing playing golf, but we kind of liked hitting the ball around a little bit. So uh, anyway... One of my friends, he he turns up and he's got some bourbon. He's got a bottle of bourbon and he starts smashing this bourbon, right? And he's not a drinker. None of us were real heavy drinkers, but he's smashing his bourbon. Anyway, he's talking to some young dudes that are about our age behind us. And he's st- and like, I'm fucking antisocial, so I'm not talking to them. I'm just waiting for my fucking getting ready to tee off. And he's getting on with like a house on fire with one of these other these other young blokes. And it's like, oh, fair enough and stuff. Anyway, we get by the time we get to the end of the first hole, and these other dudes haven't teed off yet by the time we get to the end of the first hole, my friend that's drinking the bourbon's like, you know what, fuck that guy. I'm going to fucking start a fight with him. And me and my other friends are like, you're an idiot. Just shut up. Just play fucking golf, you moron. And we're hacking away. We're absolute hackers. None of us are good. Anyway, we get to the third hole, and my friend is like, I'm going to fucking pick up his ball and throw it when it comes down here. And we're like, no, you're not. Just don't, don't be a dickhead, all right? So he gets the ball, and he, he fucking picks it up, and he throws it into the bushes. And, of course, that pisses off the people that are behind us, you know, as it would. So he, this fucking dude comes down, he goes, oh, it's a fucking teenage moment. Hey, you. And my friend goes, what? And he goes, I've got someone you've got to meet. My fucking fist, which is just the corniest <laughs> shit ever, right? So it comes down. Anyway, my friend had done Taekwondo, right? And we'd never seen him do Taekwondo, but he'd done Taekwondo. So my fr- this guy comes down, and his friends come down with him. And it, But it's only these two that want to fight. Like, none of the rest of us are into a fight, and we just think this is bullshit. So my friend gets into a fucking taekwondo stance, and this dude just puts one on his chin and lays him out. Just lays him out flat. And it's half the punch, half the fucking amount of alcohol he's consumed, right? And he's all, he's going to be all right. And it's like we're sort of all looking around, standing there, looking at each other like, what the fuck just happened, right? <laughs> so we go over to my friend and we sit him up. They end up shaking hands. They're, they're like, the other dude understands what's going on. He's like, oh, sorry about that and stuff. So we, my friend's pissed out of his head at this point because the fucking alcohol's really him. So we lean him up against the tree. And we're like, we'll come back for you on the way back. So we keep playing golf. Anyway, we come back for him after we've, because we only played nine holes, come back for him after we've done the nine holes. He's not fucking there, right? And he's pissed. We don't know where he is. So like, fuck, where's he gone? I wonder if he's walked home. He's got to walk home across big main road. So we ring up his home and we ring up his mum. We say, oh, is, he, is he turned up? And she's like, no, he's with you. Where is he? We're like, oh, he said he was going up to the clubhouse. He was going to get a drink. We probably just have passed each other. I haven't seen each other. Um, so, yeah, we ended, I can't remember where we ended up finding him, hey. But, yeah, he wasn't with us. So, yeah, that just reminded me of going into that stance. <laughs> he went into that stance and he never moved from that stance and he just caught one on the chin and he was he was asleep. It was what? good. Yeah, it was fucking hilarious. Oh, jeez. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And that's how we play golf in Western Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Not oh, good. Anyway, I took, <laughs> I took all the momentum out of the podcast. I think it's the first time yeah. I've done that. I'm, I'm so. just wondering, did did you actually find your friend? We did. I can't remember where, or where it ended up, 
Um, he hadn't gone home. I can't remember him up at the clubhouse. I think maybe he'd gone to another friend's house or something that was on the way. I just, I just cannot remember. Um, but yeah, we lost him. Maybe he went to video easy to find some more Steven Seagal tips. I don't know. But then like after that, like, cause he went into a stance and then after that, soon after he was like, Here, here's some videos of me doing Taekwondo. I don't know how good or bad he was cause I didn't know enough about it back then. But yeah, when I saw it, we, when we saw him go into that stance, God damn, it was the funniest shit ever. <laughs> and he just gets knocked straight out. And as soon as I saw that, Anybody that ever said, oh, I do karate or anything, it's like, go fuck yourself, mate. You're going to get your ass handed to you. Yeah. It's a little bit different now because you've got MMA dudes that, you know, but anybody that says, like, oh, I'm a black belt, I'm this, I'm that, it's like, fuck you, man. I'll still fire. <laughs> uh, there's nothing better than um, stories about uh, men who uh, got a bit of liquid courage. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I feel like... We were maybe 17, we were 16, 17, we were still in high school. I feel like we were in, it was like late year 10, early year 11. I think it was late year 10 from memory because we had some uh, some other drunken shenanigans. There's another story that's a way, way funny. I'll tell that another time. Yeah, <laughs> getting drunk, so yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Well, uh, should we go through our ratings? Yeah, let's do it, because we might as well make this the full, complete, grand final review. So we've both done these ratings. So I'll do Andrew's rating first, and we can have a talk about these players too while we're doing it. We'll do the yeah. Sydney Roosters first, and then we'll do the, the Canberra Raiders. So James Tedesco, you gave James a 5 out of 10. I gave, uh, Sorry, let me start again. You gave James a 7 out of 10, and I gave him a 7 out of 10 too. I think we were both pretty impressed with our the Raiders shut him down for most of the game, but at the end of the day, he come up with the big play of the game as well. Yes, and that's what he does. Um, and even though they sh- they really did shut him down well, um, he because he only made 50, 50 or kick return meters, mm. so he was shut down pretty well. But he still made you know almost two hundred meters for the game. He just has this amazing ability, especially this year, to find different ways to get himself involved in a game. Yeah, um, he's. He's, I don't know, he's he's gone to another level, and it doesn't look like he's going backwards anytime soon, so God knows what he's going to be like next year. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, Daniel Tupo, you gave him an 8, and I gave him a 6. And as I said, I I missed all of them metres he did. I was shocked when you told me how many metres he'd run for. Yeah, you know, 185 metres, a line break, and a try assist. Yeah, pretty pretty impressive. That's yeah, a shit rating him. from me, hey? CSG. Yeah. You're going to get absolutely hammered for that. Um, I really am. And you know what? Everyone can fuck off. That's my rate, and I'm not changing it. Uh, <laughs> Latrell Mitchell, you gave him a 6.5. I gave him a 6. He was a little bit quiet. Yeah, they the Roosters' attack didn't really go his way very often either. So they were pretty much just convinced that they had to play up the middle. So Latrell was sort of kept out of the game partly partly by his own side's attacking plan and a little bit by the, the Raiders' defence. The, the defence on the, the outside backs for the Roosters was pretty good. Yep. Uh, Joseph Manu, you gave a 7, and I gave him a 6. I thought he he didn't do much in attack once again. Um, I expected him to carve up Crocker, uh, and it just didn't happen. He was very quiet. Yeah, he was pretty quiet, but uh, didn't do much wrong either. Um, yeah, that's true. Just a solid sort of game. Uh, Brett Morris, you gave a 7.5, and I gave him an 8. Uh, very, very good game for a winger. Had a lot of uh, kicks go his way. Managed to defuse a lot of that stuff. He was very good. Absolutely. Um, and always been one of those players, much like his brother, obviously. Um, you, you can't stop him with just one-on-one tackle because his leg drive is so bloody powerful. And the thing about both of them too, the Morris boys, you can always rely on them. Like if you yeah. put them in the Australian side this year, and I'm not saying to do that, but just say you did, you'd know you'd get a good performance out of them. Yeah, they definitely won't disappoint you. And they're going to play like this till the day they retire. Yeah. Um, Luke Keery, you gave him a 7.5. I gave him a 6. I thought he was a little bit quiet. 
He was a bit for me. I thought the um, I I thought he shouldered a bit more of the Roosters' attack this year. Um, even though Cronk was out there and fit, unlike last year, uh, I still think Kiri sort of was the more dominant half for the Roosters this year. Okay, yep. I for well for Cronk, you gave him a five. I gave him a seven. I thought he was all right, but he was kept pretty quiet. Um, but I thought he was all right. Yeah, I thought he's. Uh, I I just thought he just played an average game. Didn't do much. Didn't do yeah. Didn't do much really. I was going to say didn't do much wrong, but he didn't actually do much of anything. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose just being out there, like he did in the grand final last year, just being out there was just sort of helps direct a few things around. But um, the Roosters' attack was fairly uh, fairly well contained, and I don't know that Kronk did much to try and fix that. Whereas Kiri looked like he was trying a few different things. Yeah. Uh, Jared Rory Hargraves, you gave him 8.5. I gave him 8. He was outstanding. Yeah, I think I had him as the, the Roosters' best player. Um, yeah, I, I think he was about their best too. Yeah, uh, 185 run metres and 41 tackles. Against Just, a Raiders pack that was fucking on fire. Yeah, he he was leading the way for his forwards. Uh, big game from JWH. Um, Sam Verrills, you gave him an eight. I gave him an eight. Very good game by the young man. Yeah, I think he has proven that he should be the starting hooker for the Roosters next year. Sorry, Jake Friend. Um, yeah, I feel like I wouldn't be shocked if Friend got the tap on the shoulder, hey? Yeah, that try that Verrills, Verrills scored that try in the first half, didn't he? Um, uh, yeah, I think he did, yeah. That was very opportunistic, but very well calculated as well. Um, very, very good find he is. He's, he's going to be a, a long-term player at the Roosters. Um, Isaac Liu, you gave him a 5.5. I gave him a 6. A little bit of a quiet game for him. Yeah, I just thought... Uh, yeah, just thought he didn't he didn't get involved that much. Uh, like, JWH was showing how much you can get involved, and he was sort of half that. Yeah. 100%. Um, Boyd Cordner, you gave him a 7.5. I gave him a 7. I thought he played all right. Yeah, he had another big game metres-wise. He always usually gets pretty good metres. Um, made a handful of, you know, 23 tackles or something like that, I think it was. But uh, he's getting very good at running um, the right lines at the right time out yeah. wide, Yeah. Uh, especially as a decoy. And not saying he was bad at it before, but he just seems to be better now than he ever has been at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mitch Orbison, who obviously went off injured, I think it was a MCL injury, I think they said, after yeah. the game. don't think it was an ACL. Uh, you gave him a four, I gave him a five. He wasn't on the field for a huge amount of minutes, but um, so that's factored into that, obviously. Um, yeah. Hopefully it's not too bad. Um, and you know what? I I thought that that might mess up their bench rotation when he went off, but they managed pretty well considering. Um, Victor Radley, we both gave him seven out of ten. He got yeah, he had a... A... <coughs> sorry, I was going to say he had a had a good a good game with the ball in hand. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he was um very solid once again. Yeah, he's he's one of those players that it's. I feel like every team needs, I think in basketball they call it a glue guy. You need a guy that just does the extra things, like Kevin Campion sort of player. You know what I mean? They just do a little bit of everything, and they're reliable, and he's kind of that player for the Roosters, I feel like. Absolutely. Uh, Angus Crichton, you gave him a six. I gave him a five. He was a little bit quiet in this game. Yeah, the uh, the Raiders' edge defence shut him down so well, considering that he's been playing out of his skin for the last what, a month and a half. Yeah, he's been he's really come on strong. Um, Nat Butcher, you gave him a seven, I gave him a six. Yeah, I thought he, he made a lot of very strong runs when he came on and took a bit mm-hmm. of pressure off some of the outside forwards for the for the uh, the Roosters. Uh, Takiyaho, you gave seven point five, I gave seven. He was not too bad off the bench. Yeah, he's he's a brilliant forward. I'd love to have him at the Tigers, mm, mm. but they'll never sign him. Nah, nah, they're still uh, 
Still just waiting for that hooker to come across the the tape. Waiting for Tim Manor to come off contract. (laughs) Imagine if they signed him. That'd be so funny. Um, Maybe they can get him after we've released him, you know, one year into his four-year deal. Uh, Jake Friend, who didn't play, you know, much in the game. You gave him a 6.5. I gave him a 4. I I just think that I was kind of shocked that they named him at all. I don't think he added anything to their team. And, yeah, just a bit of a... Didn't really do much at all, did he? No, he, he sort of provided a bit of a bit of a calm head, I guess, late in the match when they needed it, when Canberra had a lot of momentum. Um, so that was pretty handy out there. But yeah, didn't didn't really do much um, game changing wise. Just a cool head out there, uh, bit of experience. So on to the Canberra Raiders. Uh, Chance Nickel Clogstad. You gave him a 7.5, I gave him a 6. I thought he was a little bit quiet in this game. He was better than he's been the last couple of games. Um, needs to grow that bloody hair. Stop shaving yeah. your head. He didn't really get hugely involved until just after half time. He started making mm. a few runs out wide, and he was running good straight lines out there and made, made one or two breaks, I think. Um, yeah. I, I, I also the think the thing with him, it's... A lot of his game, the the good thing about his game is the way he runs the ball back. He gets mm. a lot of, you know, he gets a lot of meters running the ball back because they had so much um, field position. Like, I, I feel like that kind of negated him a little bit because he wasn't having to run the ball back too much. It did. Also, the fact Caesar was uh, it was very average, and um, I don't think the rest of the team knows how to, because they're not halfbacks, obviously, don't know how to get Nickel Klockstadt involved in the attack as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they were sort of, he was sort of looking for those opportunities from from Caesar, and they just weren't there because Caesar was sort of trying to figure what the hell he was supposed to be, what the hell he was doing in a grand final. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Nick Kotrick, we both gave him seven out of ten. He was strong at times in this game. Yeah, and there's quite a few times. I think I counted two or three times where a a Raiders either attempted a a short side play that wasn't on. Or a change of change of direction play that wasn't on, and a pass went to ground, and he had to field it close to the sideline and get back into the field of play without being pushed into touch. And he managed to do that every time and mm-hmm. save the Roosters a few turnovers in that regard. Oh, sorry, the Raiders. The Raiders, yeah. Um, Jared Crocker, you gave him an eight. I gave him a seven. Um, as we talked about, bloody strong in defence. Yeah, I mean, and he even popped up on the right side sometimes. And there was one yeah. play there where he he went on the he was on the right side to do some last minute defending, and then on the very next tackle, he's over on the left side already defending over there, and managed to force an error. And I just thought, I've never seen him defend like this ever, and you, he was phenomenal. Do you know how much I wanted to tweet that he was so far out of position in defence that he was in position again on the other side of the field? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to tweet that so much. The um, the commitment yeah, so, of him. Yeah. Smashed some plays too. Yeah. He was he was big. Great game for him. Joey Leilua, uh, you gave him a seven. I also gave him a seven. Yeah, a few big runs there, as as you'd expect from him. Made a good break down the down the uh, right sideline. I think it was in the second half, but um not enough support around to turn it into points, sadly. Mm. I, I also think he picked up a bit of an injury just as he was getting going too. Mm. Like he's he's one of those players that when when he when he gets going he, like it just it's like a snowball effect sort of thing and I feel as though just as he was about to get going he, he copped a bit of a I think it was like he, he tweaked his knee or something um, and it slowed him down a little bit. Um, Jordan Rapana, you gave him a six point five. I gave him a six. The game didn't really come his way too much. No, and. He, he didn't go looking for much opportunity either, mm. um, which is something that he's, he has done in the past. Is when he's he's been able to spot when his team's struggling a bit and sort of has known to go in and help out because Canberra were dominating field position pretty well and had quite a good share of possession. Uh, he obviously didn't feel like he needed to go in and help out, but I think that that could have helped one or two roving runs in there every now and then could have just helped to mix up the the attack a little bit more because that's what he's good at. 
Yeah, and if you don't know, because you didn't hear one of the 57 times Ray Warren mentioned it, might be going to play rugby union in Japan. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack Whiten, you gave him a 9.5, I gave him a 9. Player of the match, outstanding, best game of his career, really impressive. Yep, uh, stunning performance. Well, definitely deserved the Clive Churchill medal. Um. More so than the first Raiders player who got one despite being in the losing team. Yeah, Bradley Clyde. Mm, took Royce's medal. Fuck out, he did. Disgrace. <laughs> um, Aiden Caesar. You gave him a 3.5, I gave him a 4. Yeah, look, he, he did come into the game a bit in the second half, but uh, he was just... He was out of his depth in the first half and took... Took over an hour to find find out where he was supposed to be and what he was supposed to be doing. Um, he was lucky that Whiten and Hodgson really carried him. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I guess it's something that there's it's very few teams have won a grand final without a, a really good halfback, um, and that did worry me about this Raiders team. And I think that. Aiden Caesar did what Aiden Caesar is going to give you. Um, you know, he he just is that player, that, and that's what he gives you. Um, Josh Papali, we both gave him nine out of ten. He was he was a monster once again. It was outstanding the way he was playing. He played all by about ten minutes, which is mm-hmm. immense for a bloke his size in the middle. Yeah, incredible. Um, phenomenal. Tormalolo, that's what he was tonight. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Has been, has been for the last bloody two months. Unbelievable. He really has been. Um, Josh Hodgson, you gave him an eight, and I also gave him an eight out of ten. He was pretty damn good in this game, I thought. Um, you know, towards the end of it, he was throwing the ball around as much as he possibly could. Um, and, yeah, I, I think he did about as, as much as he could have to help the Raiders win. Absolutely. Uh, absolute gun half, uh, gun hooker. Uh, and as I said, he had to look after a fair bit of the kicking too uh, during the game because Caesar was was a bit off. Um, but he took over what just what he he took over pretty much straight away when he saw that Caesar was struggling and, and pretty much made sure that Canberra didn't struggle because of it until Caesar got back into it. And he was able to hand the reins back to him when he saw that he was starting to find his feet again. Um, very smart player. Yeah. Uh. Asia Soliola, you gave him a six, I gave him a seven. Yeah, it wasn't a bad game, but he only he didn't even play a full forty minutes, I don't think, so yeah, yeah, it's funny how they use him sometimes. Sometimes he'll like he'll play a lot of minutes, other times they don't use him too much at all. It's kind of weird. I wonder what it is with Ricky Stewart when he decides to do that. I don't know, because I think I think he's got a motor to play 50 minutes and mm. even closer to 60, but for some reason, he's kind of like Dynamis Louis. He plays for about 35, 40 minutes, and that's it. And I just think, what's the point of having two blokes who can't play a combined 80 minutes between them? But yeah. Soliola can. I don't think Louis could, but Soliola certainly can. So it's, it's weird how he was used in the game. Uh, John Bateman, you gave him a 7.5. I gave him a 5. I thought he was really bad in this game. Um, yeah, I mean, that's based mostly on uh, immense amount of defense that he did and the the plays he had running at him. He did well to shut him down. He, um, he kept Cronk quiet, which was, which was, um, a pretty good feat as well. So that's pretty much it. It was all defense though. He's, he was pretty much a non-effect in, in attack really for much of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elliot Whitehead, you gave him a seven. I gave him a six. He had a pretty solid game, I thought. Yeah, no, likewise, very solid game. Reliable, dependable. That's what you get from Elliot Whitehead every week. Yeah, pretty much, eh? Um, Joseph Tapine, you gave him a six, I gave him a five. I thought he was pretty quiet. Yeah, he gave away a few bad penalties at the start of the game too with high shots and stuff like that. Um, mm. So, yeah. Um, Bailey Simonson, you gave him a four, I gave him a five. Once again, for me, quiet. Yeah, and he only played like 10, 15 minutes, something like that, so hard to give him any more. I was being generous. <laughs> now, I reckon that this next person, right, and I, I'll say this, I'm a rugby league expert, I've never heard this fucking player's name in my life. 
he seems like he would be the sailor that you would come across when you, you know, you went down a rabbit hole or something, Phallus in Wonderland. Emery Gula. <laughs> uh, we both gave him six. He had a pretty good game. And the thing I liked about him is what he got onto the field. Um, mm-hmm. He just ripped in right up the guts. Yeah. No no fear. Just run at the biggest plays he could find. Um, brilliant. Brilliant um, interchange player to have come on. I wasn't too sure what we'd get out of him, but he didn't seem at all faced by the moment. And he came on late in the game too, so pressure was on straight away as well. Yeah, I mean, it was still all on, on the line when he came on. Yeah. Uh, Corey Horsberg. You gave him seven. I also gave him seven. I, he was definitely the best of their bench players. Um, and, yeah, I, I was pretty impressed with how he went. Yeah, I've been sort of waiting to, you know, I, for me the verdict was still out as to what sort of a player he's going to be like. And I wasn't too sure if he's going to be one of those players to be a long-term one or whether he'd disappear after 30, 40 games. But watching him in the grand final today, I think I think he's a long-term option in the back row for, for uh, the Raiders there. Yeah, one game. If they told Bateman to go fuck himself and go get money elsewhere, he he will step right into that back row. Yeah. Um, Dinamis Louie, you gave him three point five. I gave him a four. I was really disappointed with how he played. I thought he could have been a real X factor off the bench for them, and he just wasn't at all. He was a non-factor. He has these moments. He's done it in Origin a few times, and he's put in the side for that reason to be come on as be an X factor, and he just comes on and just stands around. And so I just felt that that's what he did tonight. He just sort of stared. He didn't have huge numbers or anything like that. His runs were immense. Um, yeah, it just seemed just a disappointing game. Expected a lot more from him. Yeah, very, very disappointed in him. So, <clears throat> I mean, the the Roosters, they're the first team to go back-to-back since 92-93 with the Broncos. I don't count the Super League title for the Broncos, and I don't care if anyone doesn't like that. Um how do we rate this Roosters overall team in terms of the teams we've seen in the last, well, since that Broncos team in the early 90s? I mean, are they one of the great sides? Are they, you know, I think this team is the best Roosters team I've ever seen. What do, what do you think? Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty close. That Penrith side that was, uh, sorry, that uh, Roosters side that was around in uh, the early 2000s mm-hmm. was pretty damn special. Mm-hmm. This one's up there with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will be interesting to see how they go next year without Kronk there. It will be, yeah. Um, have they got some... Oh, they've got... Uh, what's his name lined up? Flanagan will oh, come Flanagan. into the halves. Yeah, so, I mean, he's a bloody good replacement. He, uh, he's actually... And he's got a very cool head for a young player as well, so he will work really well with um, with Kiri. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, immense squad around him to to help him out as well and protect him a fair bit. So I think he'll he'll do pretty well there. That's a good a good side to walk into. Yeah, yeah, and I think it'll suit his style of play as well. Um, I I I wouldn't be shocked if Jake Friend announced his retirement or something like that. Um, I don't know that they're losing too many players that I can think of. I, I wouldn't be shocked if, and I love Brett Morris, but I feel like they got Morris as a little bit of a, you know, he's available. Morris knew there was an opportunity. I feel like that I wouldn't be shocked if Morris got an opportunity elsewhere for more money, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, Brian Hall, I would be shocked if he's not back in England in a few months' time playing for a Super League club. But, yeah, I don't think that there's anyone in this side that they're really losing, is there? No, not really. The you know, Kronk, Kronk will be a loss. I don't know that he's going to be um, a loss that sees the Roosters go from first down to eighth or anything like that. I think they may they may struggle in the first quarter of the season next year as they get used to having um, Flanagan in there. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they're going to be like zero and eight or anything like that. I think they'll be at worst they'll they'll be like five and three or something like that after eight games. And they'll slowly start hitting their straps again, and I I, I expect them to be uh, one of the premiership contenders again next year. Yeah, I think they'll be top four. Um, 
man, they're in with a good shot of three straight. I, th- I think the thing that could hurt them, I think they'll have to really rotate their squad harder next year than they even did this year. Um, and I think that they would probably, and you, you, you never wish injury on, on any players at all, but I think if some of their key players just took a few weeks here, a few weeks there, it wouldn't be the worst thing for them. No, that's right. Um, so, yeah, I, I expect them to be up there. Who they are going to play in the grand final next year? Penrith. What are wow. you talking about? Penrith. Yeah, you've got Trent Barrett at the club, so I can't, I can't put Penrith uh, in there. Sorry. Uh, fuck you. How dare you? I was trying to look forward to some next year, and then you crushed my hopes and dreams. Uh, I can't do it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, look, I expect the Panthers to be in the top eight again because that's where they should be. Mm. Also, expect the Dragons to be in the top eight, but you know that's probably not going to happen with the coach they've got there. They've got the squad to do it. Um, I don't think the Broncos will be there. So oh yeah, Penrith I can't will, see Pen- the Broncos being there. I'd say Penrith will replace replace the Broncos in the in the top eight. Um. Yeah, I don't know how much extra change there'll be in the in the top eight to be honest next year. I'm interested to see how Manly goes and the Sharks. I think the Sharkies it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with them because there's been a, a few rumors about, you know, some of the play I mean, obviously they're losing Gallon, they won't have Flanagan, so that's gonna help their uh, that's gonna hurt their depth in the halves. Um, you know, I, I, there's I've heard that uh, Fafita might be on his way out. I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah, yeah. If, I think if Fafita was to go, I don't think it's going to hurt them that much because they've got Hamlin Yoweli there, who's just pretty much a younger version of of Andrew Fafita, mm-hmm. um, who just comes straight in and replace that role in the side. So, yeah, I don't see that being a drama. Plus, they've free up a ton of cash, which they could go and buy any other forward they want, pretty much. That's true, yeah. It'll be with, uh, the, with the money they're freed up with Gallum um, retiring as well. They're going to have a bit of coin available. We get to see Paul Gallon on TV more. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so with them player ratings, I'm going to put them on leaguefreak.com. Um, you'll be able to see them. It'll be the top thing on there. So just go to leaguefreak.com and you can see, go through all our ratings and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, we are looking to take a break until tomorrow afternoon, I think, where we're going to start up again. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah. yeah, bear with us for the hiatus of, of, uh, I don't know, 15 hours. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not going anywhere in the off season. You're going to have yeah. to deal with us. So as I said, we've been working on. I've been talking about it for ages. We've got to. We do have a a good history special coming up soon. Um, I've just got to pull my finger out and get around to it. Um, that's all on me. Because <laughs> you know, I'm the historian. I'm just doing that. Especially because I take no responsibility for anything that we're doing here <laughs> as well. That always makes it easier. Um, yeah, so we've got that. We've also got a. There's a a ton of international games coming up till the end of November. Mm. Um, and we've also got some English Rugby League Grand Finals come up in the next week. Yeah, we got the. It's going to be uh, the Salford Red Devils, the Mighty Red Devils, versus uh, whoever it is. I don't know. Second gonna, place, whoever. Yeah, versus second place. Yeah, versus second versus the Chokers. Um, so yeah, that's going to be interesting. And how cool was it to see Toronto got through? Yeah, they're in. They're in the Super League next year. Yeah, it's great. It was great to see all of the fucking idiots that were saying, oh, what do they bring to Super League that my stupid little town doesn't bring? Fucking brilliant. Yeah, I hope they money. win it next year. They bring, they bring money. Money, exposure, supporters. They had nearly 10,000 at that game, hey? Yeah, and they've been getting close to 9,000 every single week they've played at home. Yeah. So they've got, a, they've got a decent fan base already, bigger than most English clubs have got. It's incredible. It's incredible. Imagine if they turned into a real powerhouse club and you know i can imagine the the fans that they'd be getting through the gates then it's going to be so much fun to see how they go next year i can't wait i i think they'll be one of the they'll be in the top half of the ladder next year mm-hmm. i don't know how high they'll go 
I'd like to see them in the finals. That'd be I phenomenal. That, but I think I first feel, year they might go about seventh or eighth. See, I feel like they're going to make the finals. Um, I think they've got to, they've, they need to add, I'd like to see them get a quality half, you know? Yeah. I believe McCrone won't be there next year, so I don't know who they're yeah. going to get as a seven. But yeah, Imagine they need, if, need to What get if a they half. got Brody Croft? <laughs> That'd be cool. Wow. Yeah, there's. Oh. I mean, we're probably going to find out because November's going to see a lot of movement in the NRL market. So, you know, it could, could be someone comes out of that. What if they said to Robbie Farah, hey, Robbie, you've retired. What do you reckon? What do you reckon, Robbie? One year's halfback or? One year's a halfback. Living in Toronto. I wonder what he'd say. I don't know. That's mm. a good question. Yeah, I, I feel like there's just a – it's weird because they're in a, a place where they could make that offer to certain players. Like, I reckon that they could make that offer to, like uh, – let me think. Um, I'm trying to think. Who would be good with that? Keep a See, if it if, – if, <laughs> Cronk. See, Cronk's got to stay in Sydney because of his misses, unfortunately. Yeah. I yeah. feel like he's that he's got his Amway that he's going to sell in Sydney. I said on Twitter earlier today, whenever Cooper Cronk talks, I feel like he's about to sell me something, like he works for Amway or something. I really do. Uh, but he'd be there perfect for him. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's wrap this be hard sharp. We well, have. Yeah, this one's gone on a bit. So uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll be back yeah. tomorrow. Um, we don't know what we're talking about yet, but... Uh, Best way to find out is to tune in and you'll find out. Yeah, I want to give a big shout out to Trish. She was asking how to watch, how to listen to us. Um, Use your ears. Yeah. Well, she <laughs> she said she doesn't have Apple and then I started going through oh, all the I ways. Thought you were gonna say she have, I thought you were going to say she doesn't have ears. <laughs> no, no, she's got ears. She's got ears. Um, and turned out she'd been listening to us the whole time on Stitcher anyway. So um, she's just winding me up, which she's good at. So... Yeah, so thanks for listening, Trish. You're, you're one of my favourites, you know that. So, yeah, shout out to her. Shout out to everybody that's listening. Shout out to the starting block. We'll try and get Greeno on sometime this week. Talk to him. Yeah. Uh, that'll be see, interesting. See if we come on for a bit of a uh, commiserations. An autopsy. Yeah. I reckon that could be entertaining. Yeah. Well, they always are, I find. They are. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Alrighty, well, uh, on that note, we will catch you all next time.